So hi everyone, it's Amy Clausen here again from the Niagara on the Lake Museum with our weekly webinar. Uh, today again, I'll be um, monitoring the Q&A box and the chat box that are at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions for our speaker or wanna make any comments, feel free to uh, type them in there and then I will send them off to the speaker. So our presentation today is the second lecture in our All Along the Waterfront uh, lecture series, which is generously sponsored by Jeffrey and Lorraine Joyner. And today our speaker is Linda Fritz. And Linda lived most of her adult life in Saskatoon, where she was a librarian, first at the Native Law Center, and then in the main library system with the University of Saskatchewan. She ended her career as Associate Dean, Public Services, and Special Collections Librarian. She and her husband moved to Queenston about a dozen years ago and was introduced to the village very quickly and thoroughly when she was invited to take part in writing a book. From the mouth of the Lower Niagara River is the story of four communities that celebrated 200 years of peace. And today, Linda is gonna be presenting Queenston, the Inland Port. So I will turn it over to you, Linda. Okay, thank you, Amy, and hello, everyone. You know, normally at this point, if we were doing something face-to-face, -face, I'd ask for a show of hands to see how many of you have actually heard of Queenston. This isn't a stupid question, believe me. Um, I met a fellow when I was out for a walk one day who actually lives in the village now, who honestly believed for years and years that when he got onto the Highway 406 or 405 heading toward the Queenston Lewiston Bridge, the village on the other side of the river was Queenston Lewiston. It never occurred to him that there was a village here. So I like to get that one straight, that we are a village, we are on the Ni uh, lower part of the Niagara River, and we do exist and have for a while. Okay. Um, a little bit of the ancient history. Queenston started on, uh, let's start with the, uh, um, the Roy Terrace. Some of you may have heard of this, the Roy Terrace and the Eldridge Terrace. They're um, uh, a niche on either side of the river. This is where Niagara Falls started. Um, it's the height, it's, they're the same height, and they mark the level of the glacial lake Lake Iroquois, now Lake Ontario, when the Wisconsin glacier receded about 12,000 years ago, the Niagara Falls was born here. The water was falling 11 meters or 35 feet over the escarpment to the small, from the small Lake Erie to Lake Iroquois. At this time, the lake plain from Queenston to Niagara and the lake was covered with water from Lake Iroquois. And you can see it, you can see uh, where the lake was. The height of the lake was 11 meters. In fact, the height of the Niagara Escarpment. The, the site of the birthplace of Niagara Falls is the Roy Terrace. And the Roy Terrace, when you just go up the Escarpment from Queenston, there's a sign dedicated to, to telling you all about it. Okay, so let's move on a couple of millennia. The earliest record of a European acknowledging Niagara Falls was René Breton de Galanay, who reached the falls in 1669. Later came Father Hennepin with LaSalle's team of explorers in 1678. And if you're interested in that part of our history, um, the Riverbrink Library has a collection of Hennepin's letters, so they're well worth the read. The, as the continent opened up, the issue came, became, how do you get around Niagara Falls? The Europeans wanted to open the interior to the fur trade, and the military wanted forts and trading posts. What they needed was a portage. The original portage was on the American side. It was shorter than the one on the Canadian side. It was 12.9 kilometers. This side of the river was 17.7 kilometers. So ours goes from Queenston up around to Chippewa. Okay, a quote. The portaging of the, let's try it again. The portaging of goods is the second oldest economic activity next to trading engaged by Europeans in North America. The importance of the Niagara River from the main route for the transfer of military supplies, fur trading items, and the return shipment of furs made portaging the chief economic activity of Niagara. Okay, so that's what we were about in the beginning here in Queenston. In 1790, of course, the American Revolution meant that the west bank of the river was to become the only one open to the British, and that's us. Now, here comes a name that's been associated with Queenston forever, and that's Robert Hamilton. 
Lord Dorchester was the Governor General of British North America at the time that uh, Robert Hamilton was here. He asked for tenders to open a serious portage road. Two people applied, one being Robert Hamilton. He'd been using the portage route since 1788 and had hired settlers to provide the oxen and wagons necessary. These settlers wanted to continue with what was regular work and regular pay. They petitioned the government in favor of Hamilton. He got the contract. He built the Portage Road. Now, if you're going up today um, along the uh, Niagara River Parkway, there's big signs when you get to Queenston saying that Portage Road is closed from the par Parkway to Stanley Street, just this side of the reservoir. That um, that wasn't, that came later, that calling that Portage Road, I think was just a, kind of a, um, an homage to, to what it was. So the Portage Road, as I said, ran from Queenston to Chippewa. Hamilton built storehouses in both villages. Meanwhile, the British military built a wharf guardhouses, two-story storehouses, and blockhouses at Queenston, Chippewa, and Fort Erie. They shared Hamilton's workers. Okay, so busy place, busy in Lamport. By 1795, I have a quote from Roseanne Fordorko, who is a, a former villager and historian here in Queenston. She says, it was not uncommon that four ves vessels of 60 to 100 tons were unloading at once. 60 wagons were loaded in a day to take goods to the upper landing, the upper landing being Chippewa from Queenston. By 1811, there are about 300 inhabitants living in the village of about six with 60 houses. Now with those 60 houses and 300 people, we had six shops and 13 taverns. Things, certain things are important. Before the War of 1812, okay, let me move on a little bit. Or I'm going to show this slide. This is one from the Riverbrink collection, and it shows the uh, the attack of the uh, um, the Americans coming up to Queenston Heights. Before the War of 1812, an American visitor described Queenston as a small but hands-on village, with most houses built of stone or brick, large and well furnished. It is also a considerable pl a place of considerable trade and inhabited by a civil and rich people. Okay, that's just a view from, um, of Queenston from uh, the Queen. It's worth noting that there have been claims that many buildings in Queenston survived the War of 1812. But, you know, if you look around the village today, you do not see these large stone and brick houses. Um, some years later, uh, going back to the history of the thing, some years later, after 1812, it was noted that the land just after the war was selling for one tenth of a penny. So it was, I, I honestly believe because St. David's was burned and Niagara and the Lake was burned that Queenston probably suffered a similar fate. And so these grand houses that apparently were here and were recorded didn't survive. Some did, some did, no question, but I don't think a lot of them did. Okay. By the mid 19th century, the price of land had gone up to th from 35 to $45 per acre. So it was beginning to boom. Industries included a nail factory, woolen mills, a tannery, a distillery, an iron foundry and a steel, steel maker. Stevedoring was, the, was an, also an important job as ferrying goods from the other side of the river was. Now, I don't know if you think, but think about it. This place must have stunk at that time. Um, tannery alone, what goes into tanning goods is um, uh, messy. Um, You've got a distillery, you've got a foundry, you've got all of those animals that are dealing with this. Queenston's built in a hollow. So a lot of things are kept in. So my guess is that it uh, may not have been the most pleasant place to live. You can smell the roses now, but I'm not sure you could then. 
Okay, the next big date in Queenston's history is 1829. And that was the year that the Welland Canal opened. Now, in all my years of living in Queenston, I keep hearing that Queenston kind of died when, um, when the Welland Canal opened. The need for the Portage Road disappeared, so Queenston became kind of your backwater little community. Well, I'm not absolutely convinced that's the case. Those businesses that I just mentioned happened in the 19th century, so after the Welland Canal. Um, a list of hotels, uh, Rosanna Fedorko, uh, the former historian, wrote, in 1792, there were two hotels, Wilson's and Pines. By 1800, the Fairbanks Tavern had been added. 1830, the Hamilton House. 1850, Queenston Hotel. 1869, Wadsworth Hotel. 1880, Palmer Hotel. 1886, Seaburn Hotel. Okay, so lots and lots of activity, people visiting hotels and people visiting ta uh, taverns. Uh, clearly, this was not a community that had become a backwater. It was still a thriving community. Having said that, um, by 1959, two buildings that had been hotels were still standing. What was the Wadsworth Hotel is now South Landing and it had gone through a series of owners. Uh, there had been a building on the site since 1801, although the building that, that, that's there today is not necessarily the one that was there. In fact, in my readings, I think that the building that's there today was possibly started around 1854. The sign says 1834, but in my readings, I would suggest that it might be a little bit later than that. Um, the other known hotel that was still, that's still here in Queenston was the Brown House. Uh, it's now a private residence. I know that because I live in it. There were other businesses that made this a thriving place when you think about it. There were brothels, of which this place was one, and there was a lot of bootlegging. Remember that distillery that Robert Hamilton built? And much later, of course, it was uh, being exported quite readily to the United States. Under prohibition, there was all sorts of, in fact, there's a big cellar underneath South Landing that you can see where they kept the, the, um, the drink and stuff. Okay, so all this went into the 20th century because the, uh, the prohibition took place in the 1920s. But it also, uh, the, um, the business of crossing the river with booze or for booze continued too. Sundays in Ontario. My family came to Canada in the 1950s and my father was shocked to learn that he could not get a drink on a Sunday. Well, we had relations down here in Niagara and they said, oh, yes, you can. You just have to know which bridge to cross and when. So there was a lot of people walking across the bridge, at Queenston, the old Lew Queenston Lewiston Bridge, the one that came down in 1961 to enjoy the pubs on the other side of the river on a Sunday. There's actually a lovely story. Uh, I met the widow of a former customs officer on that bridge, and he always packed up around 11 o'clock at night. He, um, she asked him once why he did this, particularly on Sundays when they knew that people were across the river enjoying themselves. His response was, they're all residents, we know them, there's no issue, good for him. Okay, the next interesting thing that I can think of, oh, uh, slides, slides, is the railway. That's the Queenston Lewiston Bridge, that's the one that we crossed. Um, you can see the ferry underneath it. Uh, it's, uh, um, this is an old print. By the way, these pictures, except for that first one, all come from the Niagara and the Lake Historical Society, it's a historical museum. You can see them all there. So this, um, the bridge was important for crossing, but the next thing that came along in that affected Queenston and its economy and the river was the um, railway. Here's an example of what the railway looked like. It was a, a tram. Um, 1835, 
saw the Erie and Ontario Railway Incorporated to build a line between Queenston and Chippewa. The people who were doing this were two brothers named Alexander and John Hamilton. They owned the company. Now, this uh, railway, the uh, Erie and Ont Ontario Railway Company, was very much deposed by uh, William Ma uh, Hamilton Merritt and the rest of the Welland Canal owners. Uh, they were not pleased to see that there may be a little bit of opposition in, uh, for their, their business. It took until 1841 for the entire structure to open. It was horse-drawn. I'm not convinced it was a great, um, a great challenge for the, uh, for the um, uh, Welland Canal, but it, was, it, was, uh, it ended up being used and used quite a bit. Here's again another picture of the tram going across the, the bridge. And in fact, on the American side, I have, oh yeah, you can see these structures still there from this old bridge near, um, near Art Park. Okay. At the point that the railway opened, Queenston was a village of approximately 300 people. This number is constant. It seems that there were, um, uh, uh, it was just 300 people all the time here in Queenston. However, unlike today, the, uh, there were three stores at this point, eight taverns, one wagon maker, one blacksmith, one baker, four shoemakers, and one tailor serving the village. Uh, so in spite of the train, I guess people were still doing a lot of walking if we needed four shoemakers. Other pictures of the bridge. And this, of course, is the, the uh, infrastructure for the new bridge as it was being built, the one that opened in 1961. Oh, when I was talking about businesses, I forgot one. And that was, in, of course, in the 1830s, we had a newspaper printer here. Uh, the village school opened, in, a village school opened in the mid 19th century. The school was, there was also a school for children at uh, Glen Cairn, a house that exists down the river that was for one of the Hamilton brothers' children. The Laura Secord School opened in 1914 and was in existence until 2010. So it was almost a hundred years old when it was closed. Can't believe that it's been closed for 10 years. Um, the other business that was really important to Queenston was the Queenston Quarry. A lot of work took place there, and uh, there, there were railways going into the quarry. There was a need to get the, the stone out. So, so Queenston in the 19th century may have been quieter than in the 18th century, having gone down from 13 taverns to eight, but it was still a pretty thriving community. Okay, the, the uh, Queenston Lewiston Bridge from 1899 was. Uh, um, was the one that we were looking at. It, uh, after it opened, it provided a round trip via rail from through Niagara Falls. Now the railway is an interesting part of our life here. We never got a major crossing. There was the tourist crossing through the, um, through uh, the, the, the pictures that you saw through the tram that were going around and showing off beautiful scenery but we never got a line across that was delivering goods. It wasn't that people tried, didn't try. There were six attempts to build a major railway to the US through Queenston. I think quite frankly, the villagers here are, are happy that it didn't occur, that we, we are um, okay with, uh, with not having that major railway. The, the tourist industry, is what really made Queenston what it is and what makes Niagara what it is, let's face it. In order to get to Queenston from Toronto, you needed to come by a boat. There were, um, I'm, I'm gonna uh, trespass a little bit on John Henry's talk. He's gonna be talking about the Cayuga and her consorts later in, in this series. 
But because these ships were fairly important to Queenston, I thought I would talk about them a little bit too. Okay, so there's one of the ships, one of the paddle wheel, uh, that isn't a paddle wheeler. Okay, in 1878, the Niagara Navigation Company operated the dock in, no in Niagara on the Lake and in Queenston. They were the five seas that uh, eventually used them. The, the Chikara, the Chibala, the Chippewa, the Corona, and the Cayuga. The Cayuga is the most famous because I think it was the most recent and there are people who remember that, that ship coming through. 1893 saw the first excursion out of Toronto. Um, and it was an excursion. Apparently, over 300,000 people took that tour, coming from Toronto, getting, uh, coming into the dock. The, the uh, railway came down. Um, you were transported by, by wagon up to the railway station. You took the, uh, the railway up Queenston Heights. If you wanted to picnic in Queenston Heights, you could do that, or you could continue into Niagara Falls. So it was a really, really popular holiday um, excursion. Um, Alan Shepard is another name that is associated with this village. He wrote his memoirs and I got to talk to him a little bit before he died. Anyway, he says in his memoirs that the Cayuga was licensed to carry 2,000 people at once. So that's quite a number of people. He also said that he remembers each evening, residents would walk up to the dock to watch it, the Cayuga arrive, be unloaded and loaded again, and then depart. In October, of, uh, October 10th, 1901 was a red letter day for Queenston. That was the day the Duke and Duchess of York, later King George V and Queen Mary came for a very short visit to Queenston. It was your typical thing. They got on the, the um, Cayuga uh, in, um, uh, sorry, the Corona, the Corona in Toronto, arrived here, were taken by um, train up to Niagara Falls. Okay, the trip from Toronto to Niagara, from Toronto, Niagara on the Lake and Queenston took about two hours round trip. No, not round trip, two hours. <laughs> Um, in season, they carried fruit back to Toronto. Another view of the village. This is the route that, um, that the various ships took. You can see that they uh, started in Toronto, landed in Niagara, came up to Queenston. Some of them went over to Lewiston and then back again. Eighteen eighty, you can see one of the cruisers on the river. I like to look at this picture because I'm trying to find my house on it a lot of the time. And there's the Cayuga with her passengers on. And the ship, the fruit waiting to be shipped back. Um, there were there three sisters grew up in this village. They uh, they lived in um, part of the year in Cleveland, where their father was a doctor, and part of the year here with their grandparents in Queenston. And the family owned a farm out at St. David's, and they talked about that farm. Uh, they um, let me see here. I'm trying to find it. Anyway, they, oh, here it is. Uh, one of the, they're the Ray sisters, and one of them says, our uncle owned a peach farm near St. David's. We would bike out there in peach season to help pick the crop. We'd come back with the truck and go down to the dock to watch them load the peaches for Toronto. On a 100-acre farm, six girls would pick, pack, and ship 1,200 six-quart baskets a day. So a lot of work. The end for these, um, these, this wonderful way of getting from Toronto to visit Niagara was 1957. By that point, the ships were finished uh, on that route. 
and um, the roads took over. By 1959, only the sand suckers tie up once a, um, tie up one busy dock where five passenger boats used to berth daily is the quote I have. Um, the sand sucker is an interesting thing. They started, from what I understand, in the 1960s, and they uh, they took uh, quality sand, commercial sand from the from the river. I understand there was a second uh, sand sucker down at Niagara on the lake. There is the, the, the Niagara, the name of one of the sand suckers was sunk at Tobermory and is used to teach diving skills. There were accidents with these sand suckers. Um, in November, 1970, the sand sucker C.W. Cadwell struck a submerged rock off the Queenston dock. The owner was D.G. Bottenheimer. Um, he had a full load of commercial sand when it hit the rock. Now, Bottenheimer is interesting. Our, our dock down here, we still have a dock called the Bottenheimer Dock. And uh, the other claim to fame is that he was a relation of Sam Weir. Sam Weir's mother was a uh, uh, Bottenheimer. And that was that he knew the Niagara region when he bought the property for Riverbrink. There's a whole story behind why, why he chose where he did. But um, there is a relationship. Uh, ongoing relationship for Sam Weir, Riverbrink, and the Bottenheimers. Um, sand suckers still exist. I saw a, a story on impossible engineering about the Kyoto Airport in Japan, which is an island that was built as an airport, and it shows the sand suckers working to build that, uh, that island. So they had them here, they have them all over the world. Okay. Now, other issues with the river. This river at one stage jammed with ice. Okay, there were ice jams down this river which affected the population in 1825, 1909, 1936, 1938, and 1955. The 1825 ice jam was fictionalized in a novel by a man named Barlow Cumberland. It's called A Century of Sail and Steam on the Niagara River. It was actually written in 1913. That's the 1825 um, ice jam. So there, I'm, I'm not sure where you can get the book. I haven't checked on Amazon and I don't own it myself, but I, I might, I'm going to look for it. It might be a good read. In all of the ice dams, there was the storage facilities that were located along the river were, um, were uh, pulled under. There's uh, the boat, uh, <laughs> uh, an engine trying to clear the jam. And all that's left of the Queenston Wharf on April the 19th, 1909. Still a lot of ice in the river in April. It's not like today where they, they raise the booms in March up in uh, Lake Erie to let the ice through. Again, another picture of, the, uh, of what a mess it can make. This is by May the 6th. You can still see there's a lot of snow there, but they are clearing a lovely view of the church up here. Okay, so the, the next topic that I've picked, how am I doing? Okay, the next topic that I wanted to pick was, um, was the story of the farmerettes. Queenston was the place, as you saw, where the fruit left this area. They brought a lot of young women in during the World War II to, um, to look after the crops, to do the farming, to replace the, go the boys that had gone off to work. Many of them were housed at South Landing. That's well known for, its, uh, for the farmerettes. And I guess a lot of the young men really, really enjoyed having them in the village. Um, they worked hard to do their, their thing. 
Okay, I'm getting close to the end, so I'm going to have lots of time for questions. All these pictures, I just I really enjoy them. Um, in 1955, the 1955 Ice Jam, at the time and a little bit later, there were there was housing down by the river, fairly close to the river, and that uh, the, the last Ice Jam actually put an end to that. Uh, there were, it was an area where people who, um, I guess it was, if there was going to be a ghetto in Queenston, this was it. It wasn't well, it wasn't a wealthy part of the town. So a lot of people, a few people who couldn't afford to live anywhere else lived there. Um, but that finalized town took them out and they were not allowed to rebuild. Now, the big issue is, is the river important today to Queenston? And Many of you know that we do have issues in Queenston and it has to do with the river and it has to do with the jet boat operations. The jet boats operate out of Queenston, go up to the Whirlpool and come back. At one stage, they were going all the way from um, Niagara on the Lake, stopping here and, and going on. The village is, pro well, there is concern with the jet boats because it does affect the fishing um, it does churn up the bottom of the river on occasion, but the big issue for Queenstonians is the number of buses that have to go down to the river to pick up the boats. They're noisy. One day last year, uh, one of my neighbors was able to clock 70 buses, that's seven zero buses, coming from the Niagara Parkway, stopping at the four-way stop, at um, Queenston Street and uh, Highlander, and then heading down to the dock and stopping again. So it, it becomes very noisy. They're old buses that are uh, fuming out diesel fumes. Some of the drivers are not, are probably new at the job. They, um, they ended up on a couple of occasions missing their mark and driving over people's grass and so on. So, so yeah, the, the river is here. The river is lovely. We love walking down by the river. We enjoy it very much, but there, there's, there are main issues. Queenston from Queenston Heights. You can see the boat dock down here. Um, and that's it. So I'm, I'm more than happy to take questions. I went through that really fast. Quite frankly, I'm used to having people yelling at me while I'm doing this so I can stop and talk. All right. Uh, Luann Lynch would like to know, are there any historic walking tours often offered in Queenston, obviously for post-COVID uh, consideration? Yes, River Brink Art Museum has had, went, okay, go back a step. When, when Riverbrink has made the hire student for the summer, the students have offered the walking tours. Um, a little bit of, I am the one that arranged the walking tours. I, 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 um, I um, take the students out, show them the historic places, tell them what to talk about, as, as far as I know. I do them myself. I do one in the fall for the Willowbank students, and I'm more than happy to do it if anybody wants to, because I really like talking about this village. As you can hear, I go on and on and on. So yes, there are walking tours. Um, there's so much to see here. Plan on a minimum of an hour to get through our tiny little village when people are talking at you about what's here. Um, David Murray, I'm gonna allow him to talk because he's raised his hand. So. David, you're on. Uh, I'm unmuting you here. If you want to, hold on one second. Um, there we go. Oh. Can you unmute yourself, David? I'm about to do that. I'm there we go. <laughs> I can't see you, David. That's okay. You can you can hear them. Well, I just have a couple of observations. First of all, about sand suckers. Uh, they would be now in Niagara River, something of environmentally questionable. 
even though they are of good commercial value. As many of you know, there was a sandbar at the foot of uh, what is now uh, Ball Street. And in fact, there's a famous picture, you all have seen it probably, of children standing in the middle of the Niagara River, standing on the sandbar that was there. The picture would, have, would appear to have been sometime in the 1920s. The other uh, observation I would make, the story, and uh, um, uh, uh, you have heard it, Amy, or some other people have heard it, about the Cayuga. And this is a true story, and was told to me by a gentleman of about 85 years old in Comox, British Columbia, who I met at a business event there, and he asked me where I came from, and I said I came from Niagara on the Lake. Whereupon this elderly gentleman's eyes lit up and said, I know Niagara on the Lake. When I was a student in the 1940s at the University of Toronto, no, oh, maybe in the 1930s at the University of Toronto, I would have a summer job on the ships that went to Niagara on the Lake. And every Friday, we'd have an overnight layover in Niagara on the Lake. And I'll tell you, David, those Niagara girls knew how to treat us well. <laughs> that is a true story. And my wife, who is on the other line next door here, she knows that story as well. So that would uh, cheer, cheer everybody up. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. We look forward to hearing from you and F and I. <laughs> Thanks, well, David. I think that the sand suckers were obviously a commercial thing but they were a part of the river in the past and they were employment but they ha i mean they haven't been here since the 60s I, from or 70s the 70s from what i understand just we like actually, the folks but creating a mess in the river we actually have a, a piece of one of the sand suckers on display at the museum oh good good get a picture of that and i'll add it to the slideshow <laughs> i find it interesting that um that queenston was such a busy place as well you know you, you picture Queenston as a quiet village and a lot of people that live in Queenston talk about you know how it's a quiet village so it, it would be interesting if people knew how busy it actually was with all the different industries that were there and the amount of yeah. ships that were coming through and um, just the amount of activity that was going on in, in the small village. Yeah the, the other piece for me with activity that I think probably made it much quieter than it should was the closing of the school. Um, when we first moved here, the school was a really important thing. Things happened down there. Um, the kids at Halloween would uh, pro, uh, do a procession with their costumes on. Uh, in fact, still here on Halloween, the, the, fire, the firemen um, provide a, a party for them. And so kids come in from other villages, kids whose parents had been at Laura Seacourt School come in. So, so I think the closing of the school helped quiet in the village down uh, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I'm not sure that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I don't see any other questions. Um, if anyone has any other questions about Queenston, um, I'm sure you can email them to the museum and I can pass them along to Linda or uh, the museum also has some resources that might be helpful as well. Um, it's definitely an interesting little village and um, there's lots of things that set it apart from Niagara-on-the-Lake and from St. David's and everything so um, and we can work something out and do a walking tour when it's safe to do so um, try and Absolutely. get uh, organize some of those as well so thank you so much Linda for joining us today uh, we're gonna post a recording uh, on social media tomorrow and we'll also send it out to people who signed up and to our members the next webinar is next Thursday, June 18th at two o'clock. And this uh, next pre presentation is another of our famous and infamous biography discussions. Michael Clark is going to present on Con Smythe, the longtime owner, general manager, and head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And I know he did this presentation, uh, I think a year or two ago, um, and people really enjoyed it um, and, and found it really interesting. So hopefully you'll tune in next week and have a great day, everyone. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>